All right, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining this um, session of Jifra's webinar series. Before we get started, I'm just going to go over a few technical things um, with the with the Zoom webinar, and then I'll pass it off. Um, you'll see that on the webinar we have a Q and A function. Um, so there will be a moderated Q&A discussion following the presentation. So throughout the presentation, please feel free to put your questions in this Q&A box um, and we will answer them after, after the presentation. Um, if we are unable to get to all questions, we run out of time, we will be sending out written answers for anything that we didn't have the chance to get to during the discussion. Um, so if your question doesn't come up, it will be answered. You can also use this Q&A box during the webinar for any, any questions that come up regarding technical difficulties, um, and we'll do our best to resolve that as quickly as possible. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague Giselle to get us started. Thank you, Kayla. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you are joining from. Thank you very much. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Puckett for today's GIFRA webinar. Dr. Puckett serves as a supervisory microbiologist for the biologics Development Module, or BDM, located at the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, also known as EMBAF, which is operated by the USDA. In his role, Dr. Puckett will focus research on accelerating the technology transfer from research to commercial partners. Prior to joining EMBAF, Dr. Puckett served as a postdoctoral researcher with USDA ARS, and eventually, as a microbiologist with the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. During his time with the DHS, Dr. Puckett worked at Plum Island Animal Disease Center developing FMD vaccine technologies, the bulk of his work being dedicated to virus-like particle platforms and overcoming the technical hurdles associated with developing and transitioning the technology from the lab to the manufacturing space. His work generated multiple patents, five of which are directly related to the manufacture and usage of FMDV VLPs as vaccines. Without further ado, Michael, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And again, thank you very much for the introduction to speak about a topic that has been certainly near and dear to my heart for the past couple of years, which is uh, virus-like particles. So as mentioned, um, I am currently at NBAF working in the biologist development module. However, most of the work that I'm going to be talking about here, um, if it was done by me, was done at Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Um, as most in this group are probably aware, uh, the reason why for that is a transition between Plum Island and NBAF as we are transitioning the FMTV mission here in the United States uh, from the Plum Island facility to the NBAF facility in Manhattan, Kansas. So start off by what is an FMDV virus-like particle vaccine? And, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is, is that there it's for, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to be talking about virus-like particles that are comprised of FMDV structural proteins, such as VP1, VP2, VP3, and VP4, that are derived from the P1 polypeptide uh, when it is processed by the 3C protease. The reason why I specify that is that there are various VLP platforms out there that put FMDV epitopes onto virus-like particles from different viruses. The, the one that comes up a lot is hepatitis uh, E, I believe. And um, so that, that's kind of a whole different kind of beast of a virus-like particle. So I'm not going to talk about the day. I'm going to talk a little bit just about the more strictly those comprised of the FMDV structural proteins. Production of these FMD VLPs does not require most of the non-structural proteins. Um, again, it requires 3C, but it doesn't require the others. And that, of course, makes the technology highly DIVA compatible. And the lack of replicating virus avoids concerns about virus escape. And you security and low-level uh, uh, biosecure facilities. And gene synthesis technologies, being what they are today, allows for the platforms to quickly adapt to new strains. Um, and then finally, the most important thing when we're talking about FMD VLPs is they have to be capable of listening to protective immunity in an FMDV susceptible species. But first, 
we've got to talk about the three C protease. And and I'm I don't say that just because that um of a of a soft place in my heart for the F and V three C protease. I say it because the three C protease is problematic, and that's not just for VLP platforms. It's required for processing the P1 polypeptide. It processes, but it processes numerous uh, host proteins as well. Um, and the greater the expression of the construct, the more detrimental it is expressing cell, reducing the overall antigenic expression capacity of various platforms. And there are multiple ways that have been tested to get around this. You can downregulate expression of 3C and relate it to P1, such as expression from different promoters or different plasmids. Um, I always absolutely adore the HIV frame shift mutation that uh, came out of the Perbright group. I, I love um, biotechnological things such as that. Um, you can also mutate the protease act to alter activity, such as the C mutations to the C142 residue. Um, and of course, the, the one that's near and dear to my heart, which is the L127P mutation. And there are other mutations out there in literature that exist to varying degrees of efficacy. And it's through the 3C protease that I myself stumbled into the virus-like particle field and expressing virus-like particles. Um, and, and that was because I was originally tasked when I was a postdoc in DHS to developing an assay to screen 3C mutants. Um, and we did this by tracking transgene expression using a linked Kluke reporter and monitoring the P1 processing activity via Western blots. And while we were doing this, we looked at the constructs under EM and found that when we were expressing it with the wild type 3C, it demonstrated arrays. And these were similar to what had been seen in virus infected cell culture and reacted with an FNDV structural antibody. So we kind of looked at this and said, all right, this system will look, will work for screening mutants. Uh, we sat down, we planned out what kind of mutations of the 3C protease we would make. We looked at you know, the side chains, we put a lot of thought into it. And of course, none of the ones that we intelligently designed uh, produced any uh, benefits whatsoever. However, a random mutant from the cloning process, L127P, did produce a, a dramatic enhancement of transgene expression while retaining P1 processing. And a follow-up experiment identified uh, multiple um, related and unrelated residues that could be mutated to kind of similar effects. And this enhancement is through reduced processing of host cell proteins. And we confirmed this for a couple of the ones that we had antibodies sitting around for, such as Nemo, Histone H3, SAM68, and EIF4A1. But more importantly is, is that the processing of the P1 is retained. And it processed all the tested strains and serotypes that we put in, into it to test its ability to, for its abilities. Um, and that may, and also on top of that, the mutation is platform agnostic and had similar expression enhancing effects on all the various platforms we've been tested in, including multiple VLP platforms. So now we finally get to the crux of my talk, which is virus-like particles. So mostly I'm going to talk today about work done by DHS s &T at Plum Island developing VLP platforms. However, I'm going to augment it at, from time to time with published literature and reports out there from other groups. And the reason I wanted to do that was to give kind of a more broad survey of the virus-like particle field with possible, because there are multiple groups working on VLPs. They Multiple groups have had different successes across different platforms. Um, and there's a lot of really good work out there on virus-like particles. But when we're talking about the DHS data set, it's important to understand that the DHS data set was produced utilizing a quick to fail model of development. And what that means is that when a platform would encounter difficulties, it could would be dropped in favor of, of better performing platforms instead of going in and figuring out why is this platform failing and see if we could solve it. I'll go through the in vitro data and then the in vivo data sets. Uh, most of this work was done with O1 Manissa. There is some work in here done with Asia Shamir and A24. And while we were, while I was at DHS, we worked on developing three platforms, uh, a bacterial platform, a baculovirus platform, which I will note multiple times, other groups have advanced this platform very well and had great success with the baculovirus platform, and a million cell uh, culture platform that was an expansion of our 3C screening assay. So let's chat a little bit first about the DHS bacteria expression platform. Um, if you're, when I'm talking about this, if you're saying, how come this wasn't on a single plasmid, it should work on a single plasmid. I totally agree with you. It should work on a single plasmid. I was never able to get a single plasmid system to work in bacteria. Uh, instead, the system that did work for us quite readily was a two plasmid system, 
with the P1 being expressed on a PET plasma that had a slightly leaky promoter and a flag tag 3C being expressed on a modified P-snap plasma, which has a very tightly controlled promoter. And I have kind of suspicion that the reason why this system worked and the others didn't was because of that balance of a slightly leaky promoter on the P1 and a tight controlled promoter on the 3C. The system produced a lot of processed viral peptides, including VP2. There was a lot of protein in the insoluble fraction, and there was a consistent presence of abnormal processing bands, particularly this abnormal band between VP0 and VP2, just under the 38 kilodalton um, band. <clears throat> when we looked at these um, bacteria expressing these, this system un, under EM, we did see what appeared to be VLP arrays in bacteria. Um, an early test utilizing, uh, to uh, lysing these bacteria, we utilized BPER to, uh, to demonstrate P1 processing. We recognized rather early on that that was not a commercially viable methodology for extraction. So we developed an additional extraction methodology tailored to the bacterial system. And that's the system that's the source of the in vivo data that I'll mention later. The second platform we looked at was the baculovirus expression platform. We utilized an off-the-shelf commercial baculovirus expression platform. <clears throat> Again, other groups have done a lot of work with VLPs and baculovirus and had a lot of success with VLPs and baculovirus. We attempted to produce both a 3C wild type and an L127P mutant. Um, pick three plaques from each. There were only three plaques for the wild type. We had extreme difficulty just trying to get the wild type 3C uh, constructs to grow. Uh, we grew up plaques and tested cell culture uh, media for expression. And so that's what's demonstrated here. It's not concentrated anyway. We got really good expression with the L127P, um, including full processing, including demonstrating VP2. We, we never really got anywhere with anything with the wild type 3C in our back in our hands in baculovirus. The real problem for us with, and again, in our hands with baculovirus came we went to go looking for VLPs. We we found a lot of baculovirus. We found, I, I have had some great images of baculovirus at all various life stages of baculovirus replication. Um, this included, by the way, a, a stage of baculovirus replication that if you look at it just the right way, it looks like an array. Um, however, we were unable to find anything that looked like VLP arrays in our hands. Uh, we did find what we consistently called hairballs because they looked exactly like the hairballs that are on the floor of a house of any one that has a, a long-haired dog or a long-haired cat. And we kind of suspected this was probably insoluble antigen building up in our cells. And again, it's important to note that other groups have obtained virus-like particles observed using um, electron microscopy with this baculovirus system. And other groups have a lot of positive data in the baculovirus system. I did a scan of the uh, 2023 GFRA scientific mean abstract book, and it had four abstracts describing protection with VLPs. And while they didn't specify these VLPs were produced in the bacula system, kind of looking at the authors and their affiliations, it's just, I suspect that those were all baculovirus produced virus like particles. And then the final platform that I'm going to mention is the million cell culture platform. And in our hands, this was based off the plasma system we used to identify 3C mutants. Uh, we looked at it, realized we had a potential vaccine platform here. It is basically a transient, transfected mammalian cell culture. The first generation of the platform utilized hgk 293 t cells, transfected with lipofectamine. Second generation utilized CHO cells, transfected with PEI. The cells are lysed, and the antigen is put through a 1,000 uh, kilodalton citricone column for concentration. The first generation was utilized a commercial lysis buffer to get these out, while the second generation utilized an in-house lysis buffer. Um, and the nice thing that DHS kind of liked about this platform was it gave two thresholds for potential stockpiles. One, which was stockpiling the VLP antigen itself, the way you would stockpile an inactivated vaccine. And the second was stockpiling DNA plasmids so that you could potentially do a rapid scale up for an emerging strain um, and it's, instead of having everything frozen down at um, at, a, at cold temp, you could lyophilize the DNA and store it at store it at a higher temperature. A may, we recognized that a major hindrance of this platform was always going to be cost, and that was the driver of the changes between the first and second generation uh, methodologies that I'll talk about. And the bulk of the in vivo work I'm going to talk about in this talk ultimately utilized this platform. When we evaluated it, it processed all serotypes and strains tested, 
testing, the real difficulty we had was finding antibodies to detect some serotypes and strains, particularly those representing the SAT1, 2, and 3 strains. VLP structures, these kind of arrays could be observed in cell cultures with multiple serotypes and strains. Uh, o and Asia and SAT2 would give us array. Asia Shamir was always particularly good at making arrays. SAT2 was always particularly poor at making arrays. Uh, we looked quite extensively at cells transfected with A, C, SAT1, and SAT3 expressing plasmids and did not observe any arrays. However, when we would run extracts on cesium chloride gradients, they would show banding at the appropriate density, and these bands would contain FMDV antigen. And I will point out, too, that other groups have advanced similar or uh, kind of related mammalian cell culture work expressing VLPs and have done some great looking work out there in literature, scaling up expression and uh, building on this type of mammalian cell culture produced VLP uh, data set that's out in the literature. There are, of course, additional platforms out there. Uh, there's some work out there on the yeast platform. Uh, one being expressed in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They did not put any animal data in that data set. Another being in Hansenula polymorpha, they, which they demonstrated inducing immune responses in mice. Uh, there's also been some work out there trying to express VLPs in transgenic plants. We did this with a collaborator in DHS prior to the L127P mutation and found that toxicity of 3C expression in plant cell very severely limited this expression. Uh, there's been other works where the crude extracts protected mice against challenge, and there was a quote in that paper uh, basically saying that the level of expressed antigen in that platform was too low for practical purposes. It, again, did not utilize a mutant 3C, so even when you start talking about ways to abate 3C toxicity, that might bring some of these previously non-viable platforms up to viability. When I'm talking, we're going to, so the next subset of this talk is going to be in vivo testing. And so we went about this in DHS very systematically. I'm going to start off talking about non-challenged serology studies in guinea pigs, cattle, and swine. And then we use the serology from these non-challenged studies to advance platforms for selection for challenge studies. This does not mean in any way that these non-selected platforms were not viable. This goes back again to that DHS utilized a quick to fail model of development. What it means is that there was a option that presented itself that looked closer to the end goal than the one that had some difficulties. When we talk about challenge studies, I'm going to talk about challenge studies with cattle in which we decided we needed a single vaccine dose against a direct challenge. In swine, we would allow ourselves a prime boost series and dose against a contact challenge. And as platforms would be advanced, they would be improved on. And before we talk about this, you're going to see and have seen a lot of VM images. And so I want to share two of my favorite pictures that are not VLPs. These are not VLPs. Uh, they were made with constructs expressing P1 with an active 3C. They were run on a gradient. Um, we selected, even though there wasn't a band, basically that gradient range. There's no sign of processing by any other assay. However, if you look at them under an EM, um, you will see nice, you know, spherical spheres of various sizes. Some of them are even the correct size for VLPs. Um, but I wanted to share this to highlight the importance of in vivo testing uh, these VLP platforms to demonstrate that, yes, it does, in fact, induce an immune response and not going based slowly off an EM image. So we started off with kind of a pilot study with guinea pigs. This is again against Olamnissa. We tested our bacteria, baculovirus, mammalian-derived antigen. Uh, in our hands, the bacteria, mammalian-derived antigen exceeded the performance of the baculovirus-derived antigen. Again, I am reiterating that other groups have gotten baculovirus-derived VLPs to work quite effectively, um, including one group we teamed up with that produced it with the L127P mutation. So it's not the 3C mutant that was inhibiting our baculovirus platform. It was it was our hands with that baculovirus off-the-shelf platform. Uh, found that a boost enhanced VNTs. However, both the bacteria and mammalian platforms did not necessarily require a boost to generate those VNTs. So that was a good sign. Uh, and this data set kind of resulted in us dropping the in-house baculovirus platform for future studies. Again, this fell under our quick-to-fail principle. And by this point, we already knew that other groups were advancing the baculovirus platform. And so it kind of seemed um, redundant for us to put much work into it when there were other groups that were dedicated to it and putting a lot of effort into it. 
We moved on to a pilot serology study in cattle. Uh, this one using both O1 Miss and Asia Shamir. We utilize different serotypes for the different platforms. This was not ideal, but it's basically the option we had at the time. Uh, the dosage in this case is based on total protein present. And what that really means is that we really have no idea what a protective dosage at this stage. We simply looked at the total amount of, of protein present in the sample. In the case of a million, it was 2.5 milligrams. Bacteria was 1.6 milligrams. This is most definitely not all virus-like particles. In fact, a lot of this protein, probably the majority of the protein, is not virus-like particles. Uh, these studies were adjuvanted with Montanide ISA-206. And we did perform a boost in both platforms. This is because we weren't challenging and we kind of wanted to see how it would look with a boost in cattle. But again, we kind of recognize the reality of the world is, is that we needed to protect cattle with a single dose. We got decent VNTs in a million platform at 1421 days post-vaccination without a boost. And then the bacterial uh, platform delivered VNTs without a boost as well. They weren't as good as a million VLPs, but the real problem with the bacterial platform, and that will emerge again when we tested it in swine, was that it also delivered an endotoxin side effect despite multiple runs through endotoxin removal columns. So from that, we moved on to do a in vivo study at swine serology, again, testing both bacterial mammalian platforms, um, tested both O1 Manissa and bacteria mammalian. We also tested an Asia Shamir mammalian system. Uh, and we also kind of threw in a, a, another group, which was an inactivate O1 Manissa vaccine. And the reason we did this was not to try to compare our vaccines to the inactivated vaccine, but rather kind of see, all right, how is this commercial inactivated vaccine behaving under this same study? And how far off are we from this commercially inactivated vaccine? Uh, VNTs were generated with all vaccines. They all needed boosting in swine. Uh, the commercial vaccine did, of course, and on average do better. But from our standpoint, there was no clear winner between the bacterial and mammalian antigen serologically. The what pushed the mammalian platform over into, into the winner circle for us was the swine had a more pronounced endotoxin response than the cattle, and this was became ultimately became a hurdle for the bacterial platform of advancement. So overall, before we move into the challenge portion of the data set, the non-challenge serology conclusions were the mammalian cell culture, culture platform was preferred due to a lack of endotoxins. A uh, funding cycle change made it difficult to us fully proceed with both platforms. Would have loved to proceed it with the bacterial platform and tried to mesh out that endotoxin issue. Um, however, future challenge studies that I'm going to talk about now all focused on the million cell culture virus like particles. And we also identified that swine were going to be our more difficult target for protection. So when we did our challenge work, we decided to do all our initial pilot testing in swine and then followed up with cattle work. And we, again, decided that we would allow our product profile to be a two-dose vaccine in swine and a one-dose vaccine in cattle. So with that, let's talk about the swine challenge study. We, with swine, we utilized a contact challenge model, uh, which five animals were heel ball inoculated. We would also have five additional animals that were naive. These were sentinels and amplifiers. And then the rest, we would have 30 to 35 swine in different treatment groups. The swine were intermixed before and after inoculation, and the individuals were removed from the study I sent to present it. Typically with the donors, those that were heel bulb inoculated, it was two to three days post-challenge. With the sentinels, it was three to five days post-challenge. And the reason we like to use this model was that we found it was very robust. We When we were testing these vaccines, we really wanted to test them against a very robust, very strong challenge early on. So we started this off, as I mentioned when I was discussing the mammalian VLP platform, that there was a first and a second generation. So naturally, we tested the first generation um, of mammalian VLPs to begin with. This was a single dose. Um, we tested both a single dose and a prime boost. If you'll notice, I'm utilizing volumes here. And this was at this time, we did not have a good quantitative assay for VLP concentrate, determining VL virus like particle concentration. We challenged with O1-NISA at uh, 14 days post-vaccination for the single dose, 14 days post-boost with the prime boost. Uh, when we looked at the VNTs at the time of challenge, they were similar um, across all groups. However, the clinical outcomes differed quite dramatically. There was a majority of protection in three out of the four prime boost groups. 
However, as we kind of suspected from previous work in, uh, in swine, uh, the single dose underperformed with only one out of the three pigs being protected. And this is compared to the prime boost in which we had a three out of five, a four out of five, a four out of five, and then a, finally a two out of five in our lowest dose. Overall, the negatives, we did confirm that we were going to need two dose protection in swine. We were, I'm not going to lie, we were kind of hoping that maybe we might get a better presentation from one, but no. Um, and then the other negative was that this stage, no group gave 100% protection. Positives was that we get, did get protection in a very robust challenge, and we got protection down to a very low dosage. So with these positive indicators of potential viability, if this is a platform from a neurological standpoint, um, we had to start looking at this from a, how is this scalable to uh, as a technology? Because the generation one methodology of producing virus-like particles in mammalian cell culture was not scalable. It was really too reliant on commercially procured reagents. And this added significant costs. So we looked at it and we targeted three key areas for improvement. Number one was the swell li cell line use. We, we switched to a more preferred biomanufacturing line. We changed from HK293Ts to CHO K1s because there's a lot of work out there with manufacturing and CHOs. We looked at we looked at the transfection reagent. This was just a straight cost of goods reduction. Uh, we changed from lipopectamine to uh, polyethylamine PEI. And we did not expect this to be a major hiccup. It was not. And then finally, we were really looking at the lysis buffer. And the, the lysis buffer was a true cost of goods reduction because we were changing from a commercial lysis buffer to an in-house made with common non-proprietary, i.e. cheap, ingredients. As I mentioned, the cell line of reagent changes were very straightforward. However, development of a lysis buffer required us with an assay of screening different lysis buffer compositions. Fortunately, we already had one in place um, because we went back to our old um, Gluc screening assay for 3C mutants and found that we could utilize this because while that luciferase is mostly secreted in the cell culture, some is retained in the cell itself. And those cells can be washed, harvested, and then lysis buffer applied. And we can kind of look at the luciferase readings to give ourselves a quantitative assay and then kind of follow it up by Western blotting, looking at VP0, VP2 with F14 to make sure that the Western blots kind of correlated somewhat with our quantifiable uh, lysis buffers. They did. We tested 10 different lysis buffers in two rounds, with lysis buffers 7 through 10 being modifications of lysis buffers 1 or 3 from the first round. And our top performer was ultimately the one that we called lysis buffer 9, or LB9, which is a combination of tris HCl, sodium chloride, magnesium dichloride, and 1% tritonex. And when we compare that to generation one, it, used, it uses roughly one U.S. cent of reagents versus roughly $31 of reagents from the, as the correlate for the lysis buffer in our first generation. So we kind of chalk that up to a successful cost of goods reduction experiment. But more importantly, antigen extracted with lysis buffer nine sediments at the expected uh, place on a cesium chloride gradient. It worked again with all serotypes and strains tested, and it's really yet to fail with any serotype or strain that we've tested. So we proceeded with in vivo testing in swine. Um, by this point, we were kind of starting to get lucky. We, we had partnered with a company that had a proprietary quantification, ELISA. So when we were able to test our second generation, we were able to do, produce some um, estimated uh, quantities of virus-like particles instead of just volumes. Again, we since we had a slightly different methodology, we decided to throw in a single group. This one received roughly 20 micrograms of VLPs, as well as two groups that got a prime and boost, one getting roughly 16 micrograms and one getting roughly 12 micrograms. The VNTs at the time of the challenge were largely similar to the first generation. Uh, the one exception being our uh, 12 microgram group had a lot higher VNTs. Uh, however, we did see a pronounced clinical difference for the first generation. Um, with the single dose, we had no protection. So we went from one to three to zero five. Um, there's a decrease of one, but it also could just be statistics. And the prime boost, we, we went the other way. We went from our best being four out of five protection to both groups getting 100% protection. So we felt pretty good that this second generation mammalian VLP uh, platform had not at least detracted from the first generation possibly had even improved upon it a little bit and moved forward with a cattle challenge study. And again, with cattle, we had decided we really needed this to be a 16 dose, a, not 16 dose, a single dose. You, and in this case, we utilized 16 micrograms. 
we did a direct challenge with Owo Manissa, uh, doing an intradermal lingual injection of one times 10 to the fourth bovine infectious doses. The DM, VMT, uh, the VNTs were comparable to those of a single dose in swine. However, the clinical outcome differed from swine. Um, with a single dose in cattle, we get full protection, five out of five. We went ahead and performed the 3B ELISA on all samples. As, as expected prior to challenge, all animals were negative, uh, highlighting the diva potential of this kind of VLP platform. And the other fun aspect was that one individual was in fact positive by the 3B ELISA post-challenge. And this individual also had the lowest VNTs at the time of challenge. So obviously some virus infection happened. Um, it was it was subclinical. And but again, this whole data set demonstrates that the VLPs have a really strong diva potential. And then it's also important that the second generation can really protect swine. Um, we started utilizing these VLPs as a protection control in other studies. And we performed one with a partner that was evaluating a novel non-virus-like particle platform. It is unimportant really what that platform was. Um, sometimes platforms underperform. In this case, this one was one of those. In this case, 80% of the pigs in this study presented clinical FMDV. All pig, however, of these, all pigs receiving the second generation million VLP were protected. Um, so this demonstrated protection of vaccinated swine in an incredibly, incredibly challenging situation um, from a virus exposure standpoint. It wasn't the planned purpose of the study, but was a nice kind of added boost to uh, our understanding that yes, this in a rough situation, this platform can protect. And the final little chunk I'm going to talk about is getting away from VLPs as vaccine platforms, but also pointing out that they can be utilized for all sorts of unique experiments. And the reason for that is you don't have to recover a viable virus. So it doesn't matter if this mutation doesn't produce a viable virus, you can look at it. And so one of the things that we utilized our mammalian VLP platform was investigating the role that 2B may play in vaccine constructs. 2B, of course, is a viral porin, um, and when expressed, causes membrane rearrangement. However, there is this data set out there in the ad 5 vector that found that expressing 2B um, enhanced FMV vaccine expression, and this was kind of run counter to other experiments that found that when you express 2B, it had a negative effect on the host cell. So it kind of looked like it was, should be similar to 3C in which when you're expressing it, it's a detriment. However, there was a data set out there saying that when we expressed it, they expressed it, it was a benefit. And so we kind of looked at this and realized that our expression assays and VLP platform were very well suited for us to investigate this. So first off, we want to quantify, we quantify that expression of 2B does in fact have a negative effect on transient expression. This again is just expression of 2B by itself with our luciferase reporter. We did it in two different cell lines, HK293Ts and CHO K1s. And this negative effect is related to that viroporin activity. We know this because we were able to utilize some published alanine mutations that disrupt this viroporin activity and found that when we run these mutants, it does increase transient expression. This kind of validated everything that 2B viroporin activity is a detriment to overall expression. So again, why the apparent enhancement in the ad 5 FMV vaccine platform and the reason is, is because, um, well, and, and what's interesting is, is that when we put it into a VLP vector that mimicked the original ad 5 vector, again, utilizing wild type 3C, we found that it, in fact, did increase expression. And it's important to note that the ad 5 vector incorporates some additional partial sequences from 2C, 3, and 3B as well. This is because these constructs were built in a pre-gene synthesis era. era. And again, when you incorporate 2B into this setup, it does enhance overall transgene expression. This enhancement is present in both the cell types that we tested, HK293s and CHO K1s. It's not as dramatic as an enhancement as like the L127P mutation of 3C or some of the 3C uh, toxicity abating methodologies, but it's definitely an enhancement. It's definitely there. And it validates the previous observation with the ad 5 vaccine and the million VLP platform. When the fun happens is when you incorporate 2B with the L127P mutation. 
because then when we did that, we actually see a decrease in transgene expression. And this decrease is again related to the viral porin activity because we can partially recover this expression by mutating the viral porin domains. And this effect, uh, this effect is independent of it being on the same plasmid. We also did a couple of experiments where we transfected two plasmids, one containing 2B, one containing either containing VP1 in this case. And again, it's found that when we express 2B with L127P, the overall transgene expression decreases unlike if you express it with the wild type 3C. So good news, our results in fact agreed with all the observations and data out there that they'd seen in the AD5 system, that expression of 2B does enhance expression. It does that when the construct utilizes a wild type 3C. Uh, we also, so when we looked at it by EM, saw lots of membrane rearrangements as expected when expressing 2B. Um, the ex however, when we take this, the expression enhancement does not carry over when we utilize an L127P mutation. When we do this, here adding 2B is actually a detriment to transient expression. We did not test out if any of the other uh, 3C mutants have a similar effect. There are definitely some more moderate um, expression enhancing mutations out there that when combined in 2B, might give a similar enhancing effect like 3C, but overall it kind of suggested that the transgene enhancement of 2B inclusion that was observed might in fact be acting through an influence on 3C activity. So we were looking at all of this data set and it looked like it was going to be a quick, easy, good little manuscript, good little paper to get out. And then we had a mystery. Uh, the data, so we've, Got all this data, it validated previous observations. We looked at it under an EM. We could observe kind of the arrays as we did in the non-2B constructs. They tend to be associated with cytoplasmic vesicles in 2B constructs, um, but this could just be that 2B is known to increase cytoplasmic vesicles. However, when we went and we did our generation two vaccine extraction methodology, it failed to yield any antigen detectable by Eastern blot. Um, and this is this this failure to yield detectable antigen again is definitely linked to 2B expression, um, and not because of our 2B containing plasmid, because we did a two plasmid expression system. And sure enough, once you start expressing 2B, the bands disappear. We didn't. We tried this with other lysis buffers as well, including uh, RIPA, and really could not come up with good consistent. Uh, bands for our FMDV antigens. I will add that this is not because 2B and L127P in combination with each other are somehow inherently non-compatible um, because we had done a previous experiment when we first produced these L127P mutations where we made an AD5 vaccine construct that utilized the mutation and this contained 2B and it was fully capable of producing VNTs and protecting cattle from challenge. So 2B and L127P are not inherently incompatible for producing antigen that can, that can cause platforms. And why this change in the VLP platform antigen extraction uh, remains a mystery. I, I do not know. Uh, we never really solved that. Um, I'm sure some people out here watching this probably have theories. Um, by all means, share them with me. I'm curious. It does, however, highlight, and this is what I like to take home from it, really, is how a change in one part of a vaccine platform can have unexpected consequences on the platform itself. <laughs> so moving forward, as I mentioned, I'm no longer at Plum Island, I'm now at InBath and I'm part of the biologic development module. And so here at the BDM, we are a new proof of concept production facility. And our goal is to speed up the development timelines for vaccines and countermeasures and, and help to directly support and accelerate technology transfer for vaccines diagnostics, and other veterinary medical countermeasures to commercial veterinary biologic manufacturers. So what does this mean in regards to virus-like particles and how can the BDM be involved? Well, the BDM can hopefully help st stimulate development of the manufacturing processes in particular. That will allow us to help de-risk these VLP platforms for industry partners and allow us to continue development of multiple processes and platforms, including some of these platforms that you know I, I really didn't talk a lot on uh, such as the yeast and bacterial platforms. And more importantly, hopefully we can be involved in platform agnostic support assay for VLP vaccines. Uh, VLP vaccine quantification, particularly for VLP vaccine quantification potency assays. Um, 
you know, VOP at, um, quantification assays are largely dependent upon antibody-based ELISAs. We don't have a, a good, robust, uh, a, you know, all serotype quantifications such as with inactivated vaccines. And so it are, ideally, we can hopefully help divest, um, develop robust assays that, um, of course, ideally are not serotype strain specific, but at the very least, um, if they are serotype and strain specific, uh, are robust and well quantified. And then again, there's I, we're, I'm really excited to potentially look at the potential for these VOPs in non-vaccine work, such as generating monoclonal antibodies against underrepresented strains and serotypes, i.e. The, the SAT strains, and determining whether or not we can use VOPs to develop structural or neutralizing monoclonals, as opposed to just simply um, having short peptide stretches synthesized and monoclonals produced outside of biocontainment. These VOPs give us a potential option to develop these type of structural or neutralizing monoclonals outside of a high containment environment. And then finally, the BDM has the capacity to serve as a pilot plant for biomanufacturing. These via, uh, be, and this, this has the potential to help uh, provide solutions for small markets, utilizing customizable vaccines that are focused on local isolates. So no work happens in a vacuum. And so it's very important for me to acknowledge uh, all the people that were involved in this, particularly those that were at, at DHS s &T while we were doing all this work, um, Dr. John Nealon, Dr. Max Rasmussen, Dr. Prashuda, Dr. David Brake, uh, Justin Smith, Ben Clark. You'll notice that uh, now Dr. Erica Martel and um, Victoria Primavera are bolded. That is because each of them at different times um, served as what I joked as my VLP manufacturing unit. Uh, they produced a lot of the virus-like particles that were used in the studies. Other team members, such as uh, Dr. Kamaker, Lindsay Gabbert, Dr. Barrera, uh, Zarita, Lauren, uh, Jessica, uh, Janine, uh, Tom, Bill, Juan, uh, Tracy, Emily, Malia, Dr. Liu, um, Maddie and uh, Joseph Chung all helped as they were all at, during their stays and DHSST. Of course, couldn't have been done without the incredible support of the Plum Island uh, Animal Resource Unit, uh, especially all these animal studies and all the samples that be taken. Our industry partners that we partnered with at various times in this study. And um, I also want to thank the team at INBAF for help letting me give this talk and uh, the biologic development module. And with that, um, I will hopefully be able to take some questions. Thank you so much, Michael, for that um, comprehensive and insightful presentation. I think the work that you're doing in improving uh, VLP technology for FMDV is really fascinating and extremely important. So we have several questions online. Um, first question is from Daria. Is it possible to produce FMD VLPs by co-expressing the individual FMD structural proteins and not having to use the P1 polyprotein with 3C protease? Oh boy, that's a loaded question if you know the literature. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of afraid I was gonna get asked this question because then I actually have to answer it. Um, there are There is published literature out there um, with a group that was basically expressing each individual VP um, in what it, you know the classic bacterial link to a link to a sum, um, a sumo tag. They purify it, they remove the sumo tag, and um, mix them together and say they produce virus-like particles. Um, I have not done specifically that type of experiment or specifically an experiment to prove or disprove that concept. Um, I can only speak from my experiences. And in my experiences, I had to have the 3C protease there. Um, we did do an experiment I didn't talk about in which um, we mutated the areas around the junction sites between the VPs to be recognized by a protease called the tev protease, which if you Google highly specific protease, it comes up quickly. 
Um, and that was because this predated our work finding the three C mutant, and we were we, it was, we were proceeding down two different angles. One was replacing three C with something else, and the other was the three C mutant. And so when we did this, we could get full VP processing with the Tev protease. Um, it produced beautiful process bands on a Western blot. We never saw any evidence of VLP structure or any evidence of higher structure other than that these individual proteins would sometimes clump together in an insoluble manner. Um, and then when we put, put that into cattle, we did not see any protective immunological effects. Um, so that that would be my answer is, is that there is literature out there um, saying that group did it. They saw it. Um, and, and my experience skill set, it does not, um, in my experience skill set, I had to have three C present. Thank you, Michael. Melanie. Hi everyone. Thank you, Giselle. And thank you, Michael, for that excellent presentation. Really amazing work you are doing on VLPs. So going on to the Q and A chat. Um, Alejandra Caposo has four questions for you, but we'll just take one for now uh, in the interest of time. So Alejandra is asking, you said it was easier to get VLPs for O1 Manissa and Asia Samir than other strains. Why do you think that different strains behave so differently when developing their VLPs? I don't know. Um, and I'll say it wasn't so much getting the VLPs, it was observing these, these array structures in transfected mm -hmm. cells. And it may be that, um, you know, we, we always kind of suspected that basically some some of the str strains and serotypes were just a little bit more prone to forming these array structures and cells. Um, but, it, you know, it was consistent, particularly, you know, with Asia Shamir. I, you know, I um, when I moved from DHS to ARS, I lost all my unpublished data. So I I can't, you know, just bring up this file folder that's in my head and somewhere on a DHS archive somewhere of all these EM images that we took from Asia Shamir uh, samples. And Asia Shamir would always give us these huge arrays in transfected cells um, to the point that it was, you had to zoom out so much that you couldn't define it. And when you zoomed in, it just looked kind of like a grid pattern and it would play tricks with your eyes and trying to focus with them. Um, o one Manissa always gave good images of arrays, but that you know, but again, we saw these kind of consistent behaviors with different strains and serotypes that they would behave kind of the same way. So, as for why, I don't know. I, I you know, it's probably something related um, to some level of interaction and, that involve either due to um, you know interactions between sites on the proteins or just a ex high expression in a in this environment in this way that kind of is is causing that effect. Thank you. Over to you, Mariano. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Melanie, and uh, thank you, Michael, for an excellent talk. We have uh, 3 million questions here, so <laughs> we had to be uh, <clears throat> um, try to, to be fast. Um, but, uh, well, a, a couple of them are focused on, on, on the stability of the VLPs. Uh, how stable they are and compare that with the 140S particles and the 75S particles? Um, that's a great question. And I'm going to answer it indirectly because I don't have a direct answer to give with it, where we did some sort of experiment where, where I can give you a definitive quantifiable answer as to stability differences. I will point out though, um, one of the lines I, I mentioned in the talk is that one of the benefits of these VLP platforms is that you don't have to recover viable virus. And so that what that means is that there's a lot of work out there, particularly among some of those that are doing VLPs and other groups, um, utilizing um, capsid stability mutations. And so that can definitely enhance the stability of these capsid beyond even what potentially the, vi the inactivated virus actually is. Um, and, and because you don't have to requ recover viable virus, you don't have to worry about those type of mutations, um, causing a problem with replication or, or, um, RNA loading or something like that. Um, so it, you know, it's, I'm, I'm kind of answering a question with a question there, which is, um, 
Well, it kind of depends on what you want. If you if you want it to look exactly like the virus strain, I, I don't know. Um, it may be, my, my gut instinct is that they may have a little bit less stability, but I, I've got no data on it um, and no data to say that or, or otherwise. But what I would answer is, is that because of the nature of this platform, it provides for all sorts of bioengineering options that would not necessarily be present in a uh, inactivated vaccine platform. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much. So uh, Giselle, uh, your turn. Yes. So the next question is, why there was difference differences in immune responses against VLPs producing different systems, bacteria, mammalian, and baculovirus? Is there any difference in the VLP sequences among them? Um, that's a great question. Um, so how do I want to answer that? Um, let me answer it by saying that in the methods in which we're producing here, none of the none of these samples are 100% absolutely pure in that there is no contaminating that there is that, that the, in all these samples there are contaminating proteins that are coming from the manufacturing processes. And these contaminating proteins are not themselves in immunologically inert. Um, when we did compare platforms um, from that were that were producing the same protein in some data set that I couldn't present because it, um, I didn't have it. It was done with a, a collaborating company. Um, we did not notice any distinct difference in the immunological response of the two different VLP platforms. Uh, that did not include the bacterial platform, which I kind of include as its own subset because of the endotoxins and what they can do in an immune system, potentially either as a self-adjuvating type system. But what I will say is, is that nothing happens in a vacuum. And so I suspect that these differences may actually be more in response to carryover and of proteins and lipids and other things that come along with the VLPs from the manufacturing platform itself than from the virus-like particle. Thank you, Michael. Next question from Catherine Bossart. Can you elaborate on the cost of the platform and if the cost will be low enough for the swine market? Um, so yeah, the, on, the only hard number I gave was when we reduced the cost of the lysis buffer the million system from like $31 to one US cent. Um, I believe, I believe, and I'm not the only one, um, that the answer is yes, this can be made um, certainly as a viable vaccine platform in the West and possibly a viable vaccine platform in Africa. Um, and other uh, areas where, where costs would be an even greater driver. Um, and so that's with the mammalian platform. When we're talking about um, like the, a yeast or a baculovirus, or not, a yeast or a bacteria platform, um, that's a whole different cost structure, particularly if we could get one of those systems up and running, that'd be a, that they would have a, a lot reduced uh, cost of input going in um, as opposed to a mammalian platform. Thanks, Mariano. Yes, well, we have three more questions. We will try to, to, to complete them all. Um, the first one is uh, by Shitendra Biswal. He asked, uh, do you think that the P1 polyprotein will be as immunogenic as processed BLP? Thanks. Um, no, um, I, I think you would see an immune response. And if you put enough, P1. I think it's been, if I remember the literature correctly, particularly some of the uh, work with uh, the older work with VP, just ex just expressing VP1 um, in animals. If, if you put enough in, um, you can get um, some immune response, some neutralizing response. But um, I think I think a you know pound for pound, I think a a structured molecule like VLP would would pre present a much better uh, immunogenic antigen than an unprocessed P1. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Thank you, Michael. So next question is from Maria Ines Kismondi. She says, Thank you, Michael, for the talk. Is there any in vitro test you can use to confirm the presence of VLPs independently of EM? 
what type of ELISAs are you using to quantify VLPs? Um, so really the only the only um, other test I would say is uh, running it on a gradient, sucrose or chloride. Um, for a back of the hand kind of rough analysis, what we used to use was look um, at our VP0 to VP2 band ratio on our Western blots because 3C doesn't process that VP4, VP2 junction. And so if we saw VP2 there, it meant that the conditions had to be correct for that process to take place where VP0 is cleaved into VP2 and VP4. And that was a consistent, pretty good indicator for us of um, how good of a batch of VLPs would be. In the question of the ELISA, um, that came about, we had a collaborator who had that. Um, it was proprietary. Um, we were working with them and it basically was, a, I, I think all I can really reveal is that it was a sandwich ELISA. And there are several of those out there. Some other companies have them as well. Um, they work. The, the, the weakness for them is that will always be that they are often serotype and sometimes even strain specific. Mm -hmm. And um, when you get that, which means that every time you make a new, you know, a new vaccine against a new strain, you're going to have to repeg that ELISA quanti uh, um, in terms of quant um, quantity and qualifications and stuff like that. So that then removes some of the rapid adaptability of the VLP platform that in DHS we were really looking for, which was this ability to just rapidly scale up in the event of a uh, incident of, you know, random FMDV isolate appears in random location. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have a chance to answer one more question. Melanie, do you want to take the next question? Yes, thanks, Giselle. So we have a question from John King. The limited duration of protective responses for conventional killed FMD vaccines is often discussed. Any thoughts or ideas about whether the duration of immunity for the VLPs will be similar or could be improved compared to the existing vaccines? Um, I like that you put thoughts and ideas instead of data because I don't have any data on it. Um, <laughs> in terms of my thoughts, you know, my thinking is, is that it, sh it is that, um, it will be roughly similar that it will have roughly the same issues as an inactive issues as an active vaccine because i'm my thoughts are is that structurally and antigenically it is the same um as for how to improve it um mm, um i i think a the nice thing is is that ways to you know I think any way to improve it that was found in another platform could possibly be incorporated as a VLP vaccine. It would be interesting to play with um, some combined platforms, such as combining VLPs with, um, you know, something that expresses within a host cell itself, um, a, a multi-platform type vaccine um, to see if there is any um, change in duration of immunity. Um, those are all kind of long extensive studies that we didn't really have the opportunity to do at plum um that would be once once we you know especially if we got the vlps down up to a level of this is our manufacturing process this is our master vaccine stock um, that we could really look into while building a uh, product profile thank you so much um michael um i think we're going to be closing the session now so any other unanswered questions uh, will be answered. Uh, Michael has kindly agreed to that. So uh, one more time, um, I would like to thank you, Michael, for sharing with us your uh, valuable research and, and uh, insights on VLPs. That has definitely um, sparked uh, thought-provoking discussions here in the panel today. And I would like to thank the audience for attending and uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you. All right, thank you for attending. Um, as you log off, you'll see to bring you to a short survey. Um, if you don't mind just taking a minute or two to fill that out, that will really help us continue to improve this series. Um, but I hope you all have a wonderful day.